Welcome back! You made it to number 50 by either going through all other 49 videos or you just skipped ahead to number 50. This is the last section of the Amateur Extra Licensing Exam. These are probably some of the easiest questions because you probably already know the answer to most of them. But, here we go. What is the primary function of an external earth connection or ground rod? And that is for lightning charge dissipation. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that, but lightning charge dissipation. When evaluating RF exposure levels from your station at a neighbor's home, what must you do? You ensure signals from your station are less than the uncontrolled maximum permissible exposure limits. Now, this is one of those questions in another video that I picked at because if you look at these four answers, there's only two words that change. If you notice that up to the, le the, the word the, it's the same sentence. Ensure signals from your station are less than the. And then you have controlled and uncontrolled. Controlled and uncontrolled. And then you have exposure and emission. Now, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, does that tree make sound? We're not worried about the emissions. We're worried about the exposure. So if you're at your neighbor's house, you cannot control your neighbor. So that is why it's uncontrolled and exposure. It's all you need to look for. You're worried about maximum uncontrolled exposure. So that is why this question, I actually, uh, at a club meeting one time, we had a discussion about this one question and how you really have to read the answers more than the dang question. But you're at your neighbor's home. That is uncontrolled. Over what range of frequencies are the FCC human body RF exposure limits most restrictive? And that is the VHF range. So 30 to 300 megahertz. That is because that is the where the body, the human body, absorbs the most. So keep that in mind. 30 to 300 megahertz. That's the VHF range. When evaluating a site with multiple transmitters operating at the same time, the operators and licensees of which transmitters are responsible for mitigating overexposure situations? Each transmitter that produces 5% or more of its MPE limit in areas where the total MPE limit is exceeded. I don't have a way to remember that answer. Just pick C on that one, I guess. But really, when you do your station, uh, if, you're, if you're in a place where you have to do this, and you're, again, like let's say you're out doing parks on the air or something, um, most of us pretty much know that within about 12 feet of, of our transmitter, you're usually pretty good in an uncontrolled area. And so really each transmitter that produces 5% or more of its MPE limit in areas where that MPE limit is exceeded. So if I'm running QRP, most likely I'm not gonna be the one that has to worry about that particular situation to mitigate overexposure so you don't cook somebody. What hazard is created by operating at microwave frequencies? That is the high gain antennas commonly used can result in high exposure levels. If you're doing uh, microwave frequencies, you can make a high gain antenna that's quite small. If you're running a kilowatt through that bad boy, you really could cook somebody pretty quick with that. So the high gain antennas result in high exposure levels. Microwaves are non-ionizing radiation. It's just 
2.4 gigahertz, it's like your microwave. It doesn't ionize, it just heats stuff up. B is the answer. Microwaves are in a frequency range where wave velocity is higher. Bull hockey, the wave velocity is exactly the same, 300 million meters per second. The extremely high frequency energy can damage the joints of antenna structures. That's another bull hockey. Okay, so this is really the only good answer out of all four of those choices. Why are there separate electric and magnetic MPE limits at frequencies below 300 megahertz? All these choices are correct. The body reacts to electromagnetic radiation from both of these fields. Ground refl reflections and scattering can cause the field strength to vary with location. The E field and H field radiation intensity peaks can occur at different locations. So that's just an easy one to remember. It's all these choices are correct. Now we're tower safetying it here. Number seven, what is meant by 100% tie off regarding tower safety? It means that you have at least one lanyard attached to the tower at all times. So you would need two, one, that is attached while you're moving the other one so that you can keep going up. And I'll be honest with you, I like to have more than one tie off. I, you know, you, you use your, your D ring and you, you lean back and you're just relaxing, doing your work. You want to have that knowledge to know that if that one were to break, that something else is going to save you from falling 20 or 30 feet. So 100% tie off, free climbing might have been a thing of the past. Do not free climb an antenna, please don't, or a tower. It's, it's, it's not recommended. I'm, you get zapped by free climbing and your body reacts in the way that it's going to react and you let go. Whee! What does SAR measure? That is the rate at which RF energy is absorbed by the body. And I try to find the SAR measurement, and um, SAR stands for specific absorption rate. And the reason I couldn't find a complete list is it's in unit of watts per kilogram or milliwatts per gram. So it really depends on the size of the body. Uh, you could probably dig a little deeper than I did to find that RF safety, but the, or the SAR, the SAR measurement, but it's the rate at which RF energy is absorbed by the body. Which of the following types of equipment are exempt from RF exposure evaluations? And that is handheld transceivers sold before May 3rd, 2021. So basically they were grandfathered in. Uh, that was about the date that this whole thing went into effect for amateur radio. Go ahead and do your, your SAR exposure. Uh, maybe we'll do one in just a minute. So let's go ahead and duplicate this tab right here. And we'll take a look at uh, what the RF exposure is at 5 watts. Uh, with a rubber ducky, we'll just assume that it has a gain of 1. And we'll check that out just for fun at the end. When must an RF exposure evaluation be performed on an amateur station operating on 80 meters? Ignore all of that. When must an RF exposure evaluation be performed? An evaluation must always be performed. Now, at home, if you don't make any changes, which I'm about to make changes as of the recording, I'm raising my antenna higher, which means probably going to have even better uh, ratings because I'm getting it away from the neighbor's fence and moving it to a spot where a neighbor can't even get to. So it takes it from uncontrolled to controlled because it's gonna be in my yard. So I'm gonna to have to do another evaluation. Now at home, if you don't make changes, you don't have to do another evaluation. You do your initial evaluation, sign it, and you keep that record on hand in case the FCC comes by to look at it. You don't have to submit it to the FCC. Tower safety again. To what should lanyards be attached while climbing? And that is tower legs. Now, is Roan 25 tower leg going to support 4, 
4,000 pounds, because that I think is the ANSI rating that you're looking for in your connectors and your lines. Probably not, but it's better than connecting it to the rungs, which are just quarter inch galvanized steel welded. So your your main attach points need to be to the tower legs. And if you have proper ANSI rated equipment, your latches will latch around a tower leg. And the last question, where should a shock absorbing lanyard be attached to a tower when working above ground? And if you're on a tower, you're above ground. That is above the climber's head level. You don't want to get tangled in it. It's going to be attached behind you. And so you want it above your head. And the higher you have it above your head, the less you're going to fall and bump your chin and legs and arms and appendages against the tower when you start bouncing like like this okay so always above the climbers head level now I have a question and you can answer this question in the comments what if you're working on the very top section of your tower where do you attach it then it, I, I, I legit have that question I'm gonna google it later okay so FCC RF exposure, there's a nice little ARRL write-up about um, talking about your duty factor, and you can take that into account, but as far as my station goes, if I'm running FT8, I'm going to call it 100% duty factor, and these are the gains, approximate gains of your um, antennas. I use about a half wavelength dipole, so I put 2.2. I round it up just a little bit. And so let's go do a couple of those really quick before we get to the end. We're done with that screen. This is the RF exposure calculator. I think you can see the link. It's hintlink.com forward slash power underscore density dot htm. You can find this if you dig around through the AWRL stuff, but it's not easy to find if you want to find it quick. But here it is, and there's the link right there. So my average power to the antenna is about 90 watts. How did I figure that out? I took in the losses of the coax that runs from my antenna tuner to the, um, to the antenna. And then I took in the loss of the 100 feet that runs from my radio to there. It comes out to about 90 watts that makes it to the antenna. Um, it's actually a little bit less than that, but it's okay to, to overestimate what you have here. My antenna, 2.2 .2 is for dipoles. Again, I round it up. You put in the area of interest. Let's say that I have a 20 feet area around my antenna that's accessible by humans but that area is blocked off by a fence i put seven meters and let's look at uh 14 megahertz so we're going to be working on 20 meters and click calculate rf so you can see that really six feet in the uncontrolled environment six feet so out in that area there there there's slightly things blocking it off so really it's a controlled environment that fence could be a lot closer at 2.72 feet okay so let's go back and say that we're operating at 52 megahertz now that's the six meter band this is where the body is going to absorb quite a bit of it notice that 12 feet is my area in, in compliance yes but did you see how that got real big real fast um let's do one more let's say that I, I would not use my long wire for this but let's just say that 146 megahertz what's it going to look like it's still about 12 feet so hey that's not too bad um, most of my VHF and UHF antennas are actually 20 feet straight up by the house. Nobody, nobody's going to get near them. So I'll have a signed copy of that performed on what date did you perform it and who performed it. 
and then you print that out and keep it in your station records. So let's look at five watts coming from your FT60. The gain of that antenna is probably crap, so we're going to put one, and we're going to go one meter of interest, even though really we, I'm, really it's only a third of a meter. Let's put 0.3. Let's say that you operate your, your HT from only this far. Here's my beverage antenna. This far. That might be a foot from my face. And we're operating at 146. That's about the middle of the 2 meter band. And we click calculate RF distance. Is that within? No. Look at there. So you can see that even even operating like this it's not within isn't that weird so what if what if i have zero gain dbi still even with zero gain dbi 146 megahertz at five watts you really want to limit how much you transmit near your noggin okay because it could cook you now just for fun what about operating on 444 megahertz? So we're still looking at the same thing, 5 watts. It's, you really need to be more than a foot from, from your controlled environment, and you need to limit how much you transmit. Do we, do we hold that thing down for hours at the time? No, the battery will go dead. But it's just interesting to see what, what you got there. So... Alrighty, we're at the end of this thing, and here was my 10 meter, 28 megahertz, 10 meters. See that it's right at 12 feet. If we were to go back and do 7 megahertz, you can see at 7 megahertz, it's only 3 feet. And for uh, 3.5, that's your 40 meter band, you can see that 1.5 feet, even at 90 watts, you don't have to be that that far away from it even in an uncontrolled environment so the body absorbs those higher frequencies a little bit better alrighty so I went into depth on on some of those for the the FCC stuff but we have reached the end and so uh, maybe now I can get back to doing some ham test trivia on Thursday nights uh, by the time four years is up I may not do that anymore so it may not be relevant just check the channel and you'll see well, boom, when I close out of that, that right there lets you know that we have made it to the end of this particular study. And you've seen mostly my kitchen through this one. The technician one was part kitchen, part living room. And uh, we're done. So go back and study, take some practice exams. And uh, later this week, which is going to be... You know, I'm going to release these videos once I get the thumbnails made, but I am going to go take a practice exam, a random practice exam from the extra license. And just from me making these videos, I'm going to see how I do just by going over it once or twice, maybe three times if the dogs interrupted me, uh, doing the research that I did to find the ones that I could explain. And I do implore you, now that we're at the end of this, that uh, if, if the videos helped you, go back and like the videos that were very helpful. Don't dislike the ones that weren't helpful. That's not nice. Um, give my channel a subscribe, a subscribe to help me out. You don't have to click the bell. Um, don't know if that has anything to do with freaking YouTube metrics or not. But, hey, every subscription encourages me to make more content. And I'm trying to make useful content, too, sometimes. So, hey, I'm Robbie W1RCP. We're all in this together. Have a great one, 73.